Thank you very much and presenters, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jenna. Well, and I'd like to thank ICPSR for hosting this presentation. Um, today we're gonna present methods and analytic approaches for physically disabled persons using administrative claims data sets. Um, it's gonna be presented by myself. Uh, my name is Neil Kamdar. I'm the um, managing statistician for the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation Data Methods Hub. And my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Al Mahmoudi, who's an assistant professor of family medicine with a specialty in health economics. And we're going to talk specifically about introducing administrative claims for those who don't understand them or haven't um, interfaced with them in the past, and then also go through a case study. So um, Dr. Mahmoudi and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. This work is funded by the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. So our overview for today is that we're gonna talk about an introduction to claim study design. We're gonna go through a case study of um, uh, background with AIMS, the application of data methods, they, you know, informed by um, broad framework of study design that's been, um, that'll be discussed earlier. Uh, results, policy implications with respect to the study, limitations, future work, and any questions and answers at the end. So we're gonna spend the first segment of this talk really getting into some details regarding claims and um, you know, sort of the landscape around public and private insurance. So for those who are unfamiliar with administrative claims, administrative claims are health insurance claims, primarily for billable services. So if you go to, um, if you go to the doctor's office or if you have surgeries or if you're getting, you know, various kinds of uh, post-discharge care in skilled nursing facilities, et cetera. That's what is covered here. Uh, these are billable services. So this is anything that occurs between patients and the healthcare provider. So providers would include physicians, hospitals, including their brick and mortar facilities, and also anything that occurs between healthcare providers and the payer. So we use insurance and payers interchangeably um, as terms. This data is standardized from the supplier or vendor. And then a lot of times it's used for assessing costs and use of services. This data, part of its challenge is that in many ways, the data has not been assembled or designed for research purposes. So there's a lot of programmatic algorithms that go in to develop them into analytic files. So the contents of administrative claims data include you know, hospital care, so any kind of hospitalization, utilization of skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes, hospice and home health, physician visits, for instance, office visits or preventative care ser services, anything related to ambulance services, um, especially true for those with physical and or sensory disabilities, you know, durable medical equipment or DME claims as they call them, and any kind of prescription drug coverage or outpatient uh, prescription fills. So within the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, we typically work with three different um, large claims databases or their vendors. Uh, including Medicare and Medicaid from CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Truven Health Analytics, uh, which is uh, from IBM. They uh, have private payer data. And then Optum Insight, which is also um, related to a single private payer. There's other external data sources to claims that can be considered as well, which are also listed below. So to give a landscape about the size and scope of insurance claims data, we have public insurance, which is Medicare, fee-for-service, and then private insurance, which can be split into Optum Insight or Truven Market Scan. The years that we've had in the past within the Institute include, you know, from the early 2000s all the way up to 2018 or 2019, there's um, million, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of covered lives 
And if you look across each of the columns, you can see all the different aspects of, you know, what are the different attributes about these members that we have available. So we'll talk briefly about both private, public and private claims. So in particular for Medicare, you know, we have part A, which is hospital care, uh, skilled nursing facilities are also called SNFs, nursing homes, hospice and home health. Then you can also have part B coverage, which is physician visits, ambulance, durable medical equipment and preventative services. Uh, I'm gonna skip to part D, which is really prescription drugs. And then part C is if you have some kind of, where you buy supplemental coverage, like a Medicare HMO or some kind of gap coverage that is usually not addressed with Medicare fee-for-service. So you can think of part A and B as fee-for-service. On the other hand, for commercial insurance, you have medical claim files, which includes all inpatient, outpatient, professional claims lumped together. And then inpatient includes hospital, acute care setting, SNF, et cetera. And then we have outpatient, which is any kind of outpatient surgery or ambulatory care. And professional services, which would be physician and allied health related claims, and then pharmacy for outpatient prescriptions. So we'll use an example sort of related to um, Optum Insight, which is also going to inform the study that Dr. Mahmoud is going to talk about. But we, uh, there's a bit of a relational database design uh, where we have enrollment information, including, you know, the member info that could have some kind of socioeconomic variables or data death or any kind of attributes about the members themselves. So we can consider this either patient specific or um, patient enrollment specific. And I'll get into more detail about what I mean by enrollment in a moment. A lot of times these enrollment files can be merged or joined to medical claims. So these medical claims is a composite of basically all the types of services that are being used by the patient that are billable. So that could include across any patient setting for which we have billable services, and we can identify the types of procedures uh, based on various procedure codes, as well as medical diagnosis based on um, diagnostic coding. In addition, all these claims databases have facility and provider information. So for instance, if you wanted to know what type of provider, you know, for instance, if you wanted to know if there was a mental health provider or a psychiatrist, or was a nurse practitioner even performing these services, you may get some kind of uh, provider identification of the type or their specialty. In addition, there's pharmacy and lab claims. Um, this varies by data provider. Uh, all of these claims, uh, I mean, all of these vendors include uh, pharmacy claims and a subset of them, Optum is an example that includes lab claims as well. So to give you a sense about enrollment file, as I was discussing in the previous slide, the most important thing is to have a window of time for a patient to go and have their enrollment. That window of time is useful because it helps us determine the coverage period where we will have, um, we'll have the capture of any types of services, any types of claims for these patients. So this is extraordinarily important in any kind of longitudinal analysis. Otherwise, we lose that visibility if anything is occurring outside of a certain enrollment period. So the effective and end dates, as they're called here, where the left column is effective, the right column is an end date, this shows for these specific patients what are their start and end dates of being enrolled on a plan. So we typically start with this as a possibility to start identifying people who have particular amounts of enrollment. Then we also have diagnosis or procedure files. And these can be oriented in two ways. I'm presenting one that's sort of in long form, but they can also be transposed into wide form depending on the type of files we get. So this shows, for instance, that there's diagnostic and procedure codes for specific patients that could occur on a certain date, the FST date being a service date. And what we can say is these are the types of diagnoses or the types of clinical conditions 
that were identified at the time of service. And so we use this information primarily to identify comorbid conditions. This could be anything from hypertension or cardiac disease, or they may have had some kind of di diabetes or disabilities. These are all typically captured in diagnostic codes. There can be more than one that occur for a given date. So we can have something that's concomitant with, say, a principal diagnosis. So there could, people could have also diagnoses that are present on their admission, so at the time of when they come in, or they have a history of these diagnoses. In addition to the enrollment file and the diagnosis and procedure files, we have medical claim files, as, a, as I was discussing. The key component of the medical claim files is that this contains a lot of the financial information. So we want to talk about, for example, in this particular snapshot, we're showing that for every patient ID, you can think of this as almost like an invoice, that every line item here, every row represents some kind of charged service, something that was billed to the insurance company. So there's various terms that we use in the claims world. One is that what is charged. So this is the amount that's submitted by the provider to the insurance company for the services rendered. This is the amount that they're requesting basically for reimbursement. And then the coinsurance is one of the patient payment contributions. So this is, for example, your insurance plan may allow you to go in and pay, uh, may allow you where you have to pay a coinsurance for your service. There's also, as we extend this, there's a, it, the additional snapshot here shows that we have co-payments and deductibles. And co-payments and deductibles are basically just telling us that we have, these are also patient out-of-pocket payments. And then on the right, we see this field called PROC-CD, which is just the current procedural terminology codes. These are additional codes for billable services performed, and every line or row on the file represents a service. And finally, again, more financial information, there's a standardized cost, so price standardized uh, reimbursement. So this is, you know, this is basically to account for contractual or regional differences between, uh, between providers and places, and also the service settings. So this is supposed to go and kind of create an equal playing field around what the reimbursement is for those services and types of services as well are also indicated by the TOS CD. So when we think about study design and uh, creating uh, cohorts basically, or our populations of interest, many times they're anchored by what the enrollment should look like. So for example, it, especially when we're talking about you know, disabled uh, you know, people with disabilities, we are also talking about those that have either acquired conditions or congenital conditions. So some assumptions have to be made in terms of how we want to go ahead and have a sufficient period of time to, you know, review these people longitudinally. So if we look at an index event, the terminology around an index is basically however we as researchers wish to define them. So we may say that an index event must require a certain amount of enrollment time after and a certain amount of enrollment time before it. There's a pre-index period and a post-index period. So if you think of the index event in our case might be spinal cord injury as a diagnosis. Relevant, uh, this will be very relevant when Dr. Mamoudi discusses this further. So we have an index event where we've identified people with a condition. And then in the post-index period is where we're gonna review, we have a sufficient period of time in order to identify potential outcomes of interest. So when we look at the post-index period up until their ending end time of enrollment, we could check for number one, clinical outcomes, in infection, readmission, other diseases. We can check for service utilization, such as preventive services, hospitalizations, total costs, et cetera. However, 
you can't just start at the index event and keep going forward. You have to look at the patient history. So we look at a pre-index period, and the pre-index period is allowing us to collect almost like an inventory, hopefully, enough of a window of time inventory of incident index events and also comorbid conditions. So comorbid conditions would be anything that you may want to consider for risk adjustment. Maybe they have hypertension, maybe they have diabetes, et cetera. Maybe they have co-occurring physical disabilities that you want to consider. And when we talk about incident index events, because they are restricted on their enrollment, we want to go and look at if there's a sufficient amount of time in which they do not necessarily have any service that shows that event. So we may wanna say that someone who has spinal cord injury as their index event has particularly like a year or two years beforehand of enrollment where we have no evidence of it whatsoever. So we then kind of infer that the spinal cord injury event itself is a new event for that patient. In contrast to the acquired conditions, with congenital conditions, it's slightly different. So if you think about a congenital physical disability like cerebral palsy or spina bifida, we actually start with assuming that at the time of enrollment, when they start, that they're actually prevalent for the condition. But we want to collect some comorbidity history. So we check for prevalent conditions in this kind of fictitiously defined pre-index period. And so we create this index fictitious date. It might be one year after their start of enrollment or two years, subject to sample size considerations. And they'll carry forward in the post-index period in much the same way to identify outcomes, clinical outcomes or costs or service utilization. So this is just our way of trying to define sort of a pre-post pre and index event whether it's congenital or acquired. In acquired, we're trying to show that it is an incident event. In the congenital case, we assume that everybody is prevalent at the time of enrollment. And so some common analytic approaches, I mean, there's the cost component here, which is um, very salient. So it's, it you know, helps us use econometrics uh, such as episode cost analysis after treatment. So for instance, if, there, if you have a treatment for surgery or a diagnosis or some kind of drug application or a device insertion, and you want to go ahead and show that there is a, um, you wanna show that episode costs over time are uh, you know, changing as a result of treatment, you're getting a better sense of whether the differences are salient, say stratified by race. You can also look at patient out-of-pocket contributions. So in addition to um, episode costs or standardized reimbursement, we can look at patient out-of-pocket payments. We can look at also because payment itself is highly skewed, we usually use generalized linear models we assume gamma, distribu a gamma distribution and uh, log link. Many times in order to account for selection bias, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides, we use, any, we use propensity score matching or weighting to estimate treatment effects on episode costs or patient out-of-pocket payments. Because of, the, because of the longitudinal nature of administrative claims, it also lends itself to conducting time to event analysis, like survival analysis. So we may want to look at the time to the event of death or infection or some kind of diagnosis, or maybe they had some event that occurred as there is, maybe for instance, what is the recurrence rate after cancer treatment? if they have some kind of surgical intervention and we wanna know if they get some kind of uh, recurrence of cancer, maybe we can look over time to see within an X amount of years if they have recurrence based on diagnostic codes, provided, that they, provided they meet the sufficient enrollment criteria. So this time to event analysis estimation you, you know, uses hazard ratios after an index diagnosis or procedure. 
In addition, we use Kaplan-Meier curves for product limit survival, and that will be exhibited in the case study. And we use uh, Cox or Weibull survival models informed by the distribution of the length of days in the follow-up period to sort of help us disentangle what is the most appropriate survival model to use. In addition, also commonly applied are propensity score approaches. There's also instrumental variables that are, that are used, although not used quite as often, I think, in, in our health policy, health services space. But uh, you know, propensity scoring has been used in our, um, in our studies. And so this is really to control for selection bias attributable to being in the treatment group. So you know, usually clinicians and statisticians you know, speak about what are the relevant confounders that we wanna use for adjustment. And then the propensity score you know, assigns a likelihood to be selected to the cases versus the controls. You can use a number of different ways to sort of, um, you know, compare that there's covariate balance and then assess that there, you know, and you could use, for instance, stratification or weighting or matching as your commonly used approaches. And in many ways, this allows us to create equal playing fields between your two groups, removing selection bias and then comparing clinical outcomes or economic outcomes, and even on matched cohorts or on weighted, you know, or using weighting to do weighted models, uh, you know, multivariable models or bivariate comparisons. So a lot of times because uh, claims analyses are sufficiently large that you're statistically overpowered, we have resorted in many cases to using you know, Cohen's H or Cohen's D for, you know, standardized differences or effect size calculations, um, even to assess covariate balance after matching. And so with that being said, uh, you know, that concludes sort of a framework around the, an introduction to claims and methodologic approaches. And uh, Dr. Mamoudi will, will transition us towards a case study. Great. Thank you, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to go over. I, heard, I, I can hear my own echo. Yes, actually, I was going to interrupt and say, there we go. That might fix it. All right. Yes, I can't hear any echo right now. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alham Mamoudi. It's a pleasure to present or go over the second part of this presentation. These are three studies that we used optum data uh, to examine association between congenital or acquired physical disability conditions and risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Uh, before I start, let me see. Uh, give me a second. I have problem with, uh... okay, there you go. Sorry, I have a bit of an issue controlling the screens. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge co-investigators in this uh, project. Specifically, I would like to thank Pauline in this group who, were the, who was the analyst for these three studies I'm presenting. So to give you a background, we looked at three different uh, physical disability conditions, uh, congenital, for congenital condition, we looked at uh, cerebral palsy or spina bifida, and then we looked at multiple sclerosis that usually occur at middle ages, and uh, traumatic spinal cord injury, which is event-based and can happen at any time. So to give you a background, uh, CP and spina bifida are both congenital conditions um, known to cause an array of permanent movement disorders, pain, stiffness in muscles, and with the incidence rate of about three per 1,000 births for CP and one per 3,000 births for spina bifida. And over the past two decades, the life expectancy 
uh, for individuals with CP and spina bifida has substantially increased. MS, on the other hand, is a chronic inflammatory disease of central nervous system, which occurs, which been diagnosed usually between the ages of 20 and 40 at middle ages. And they're very much uh, similar pathology uh, between MS and Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Traumatic spinal cord injury, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, can happen at any time and it's caused by uh, vehicle accidents, falls, or act of violence. Um, and again, due to that neuronal damage, uh, traumatic spinal cord injury may exacerbate and initiate and trigger some certain biological mechanism that increase the risk for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease specifically. So what do we know about these conditions and risk of ADRD? What do we know about these conditions in general? Um, up to, to, to this date, most research on CPN spina bifida has been mainly focused on pediatric issue, mainly again, as I said, because life expectancy for individuals with these conditions have been much lower um, 10, 20 years ago. So that's not a surprise. Um, and most of the, because of the most research related to MS in that area has been, again, focused on the similar pathology. It's mostly based, were based on clinical trials. Therefore, the sample size were small and the results have been mixed. So there's no um, evidence based, based on large data national analysis uh, examining the risk of MS for incident ADRD. And for spinal cord injury, again, the focus has been, been for all these conditions actually, it's been more focused on physical aspects of these conditions, like uh, bladder and bowel movement, kidney conditions, uh, and not much on cognitive function. What do we know about chronic conditions? And that's actually how this study has started using the same project, using Optum data and other data sets. We know that prevalence and incident rate of cardiometabolic, psychological, and musculoskeletal conditions are substantially higher among individuals with physical disabilities. And it's not surprising. We know that these individuals, because of their disabilities, have a um, more sedentary lifestyle, um, less exercise, um, and physical activities. But not much known about, again, uh, cognitive uh, conditions and level of cognitive con conditions and how this change over time. So this higher prevalence of these comorbid conditions also is a risk factor for ADRD. After we conduct this analysis of um, chronic conditions, comorbid conditions, and higher risk of them among these individuals, that's how these set of three studies were born. We were curious to see um, how's the risk of ADRD among this population. So um, the objective for this study was to examine time to diagnosis and adjust the hazard for incident ADRD, comparing adult with and without CP and spina bifida, MS, and traumatic spinal cord injury. So uh, to make this study very conservative, because we are looking at ADRD, we conducted using unadjusted, adjusted, unmatched, and fully matched, meaning that we matched our cases and control cohorts uh, 100%, not just based on demographics, but also based on um, prevalent of chronic conditions that we saw among them, and also based on socioeconomic variables that, was a bit, that were available in uh, Optum data. So to go over our data set, as we, um, Neil mentioned, we used Optum Insight, a decade worth of data from 2007 to 2017. To define our cohort, we used ICD-9 code, again, based on what um, Neil presented, 
uh, prior to this part of the presentation, our patient population were adults age 45 and older. Um, and um, we used ICD-9 codes for, to define each set of these diagnoses. And we used our outcome of interest was um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And for that, we used both ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. And we followed this individual four years to, to examine time to diagnosis of the condition since our index date. And we'll talk about that. So to give you an overview, we, we had about 7,000 cases of each of these set of conditions. And um, when we matched our cohort completely, these are the number of adults in cases and control. And just to mention here, our control cases for each set are people who did not have any type of disability um, based on diagnosis code again. Um, so for study design, again, our outcome of interest was incident ADRD within a four year of index time period. Um, our independent variables were demographics. For demographics, we use age, sex, race, ethnicity, and US Census Division. And we included diagnosis of cardiometabolic, physiological, and musculoskeletal condition during that one year look back period. If you remember from what Neil mentioned earlier from the graph in pre versus post. So in this specific case, pre-index pre period was one year and post-index year were four year follow-up period. And we had network and educational attainment for socioeconomic, uh, as a socioeconomic status. So uh, because we were looking at time to diagnosis of ADRD, we used Cox um, survival model uh, to quantify four different basically model using bivariate unadjusted, fully adjusted based on the variables that I mentioned earlier, and propensity matched, unadjusted, and adjusted matched hazard ratios. The last one being the most conservative type and cleaner type of analysis. And I'm going to go over the results for each of these uh, three sets of disability condition. So the, the, uh, one of the most interesting findings that we had in our analysis, and you will see it, I'll give you a uh, preview. Uh, we divided the age between early onset among 45 and 64 years old and 65 and older. So um, in among all three sets of disability condition, uh, we found higher risk for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia among um, younger age cohort, which is the early onset ADRD. So in this case, for example, for individuals with CPN and spina bifida, as you can see, although the rate is low, but um, the blue represent our cases, people with the diagnosed CP or spina bifida, uh, it's 1.4% compared with 2%. So the risk is seven times higher among these individuals. As they get older, uh, that risk uh, goes up, but the difference between the two groups obviously getting smaller because as people age, even, if, even without disability, the risk for Alzheimer will go up. These are, by the way, our unadjusted data. The left side represent uh, unmatched data for two different age groups, and the right side will uh, represent the results for our matched cohort, but not adjusted. These are basically the rate for incident ADRD. And these are a KM curve for adults with CP and spina bifida. The blue line represent our cases, and um, the red line represent our control, people without disability. As you can see, uh, over the three-year period in this case, because this is for congenital condition, we can see that this diverging 
although small, but you see the divergence between cases and control in diagnosis of um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. By the way, all these differences that I'm showing are statistically significant. And this is our final result. So I'm going to focus only, these are, these, this table represents the hazard ratio. These are the results of our Cox regression model. I'm going to focus on two columns, the very left, unadjusted and unmatched. And then the last column, which shows the adjusted matched cohort, the result, the hazard ratio for adjusted matched cohort. So as you can see, early onset, the first row for among 45 to 64 year old, the hazard ratio is 7.8 times higher um, among individuals with CP and spinal If you look at the last column for this age group, it's three. 3.3 times higher, the hazard ratio is about three for these individuals. That, when we look at the older adults, it's the, the hazard ratio is reduced, but it's still significant. Again, among the unadjusted is 2.49. And then when we match their cohort for everything in our model and adjust for everything, it comes down to 1.6, which is still 1.7 almost, which is still significant and higher. And we see the same result among all three groups of individuals with disability. Almost the same results for people with multiple sclerosis. Again, here we see a seven times higher among individuals um, in their middle age group, 45 to 64, which doesn't change much among our matched cohort. And the same pattern is uh, being seen here as well. The KM curve is very similar to what we see among individuals with CP and spina bifida. And again, our final table for MS is very similar. Um, I go over the first row for um, early onset Alzheimer, which is disturbingly high, is about 5.2 for unadjusted data and unmatched data. And it didn't change much, much actually when we matched our cases and control and adjusted for everything is about 4.5. It reduces again among older adults, but it did not disappear. And this is, these are our results among individuals with traumatic spinal cord injury. Again, we see among the younger cohort, the unadjusted um, ADRD rate is about twice among younger group is lower but it's twice comparing case and controls obviously as they get older the rates are higher and the difference is substantial what is significant here that we see when we matched our cohort the difference again becomes uh, much less but um, still significant And these are KM care, um, much sharper divergence between cases and controls among individuals with a spinal cord injury. Um, and these are the results for hazard ratio. Again, for unadjusted, unmatched, uh, among early, uh, younger cohort is about 4.8. It comes out to 1.93 for adjusted matched cohort and the same pattern among older adults. Um, so it's, um, we, can, we can conclude, as we see in the conclusion section here, that um, these three sets of congenital or acquired um, disability condition all increase the early risk, risk of early onset Alzheimer much higher that they do increase the risk of Alzheimer at older age. But regardless, both among middle age and older adults, uh, they do increase the risk substantially and significantly. Um, and uh, the fact that when we matched our cohort, uh, it reduces the risk sub a little bit compared with unmatched cohort 
is we can speculate that the fact that when we match these two groups based on chronic condition is indicative that these chronic conditions that also increase the risk of ADRD play a role. So we, when we match these two cohorts together for these conditions, we kind of put them in the same boat and that might reduce the hazards in our model. So our study had a few limitations. I, let me just check the time. Um, I'll go through them very quickly. These are obviously based on claim data. Uh, we know there is a issue regarding underdiagnosis of ADRD and some other conditions such as MS is also underdiagnosed. Um, and there is a lack of other measures of cognitive function. Um, diagnosing, there is no uh, objective method of uh, ADRD diagnosis. So when we use claims data, we have to be aware of that. Um, and uh, we might have difficulty identifying certain clinical condition, any type of condition. If I don't go to a doctor, it's based on claims. Um, within that one year look back period, it would not appear in the bills and claims. So uh, we might underdiagnose these conditions. And fourth, the results are not representative of US. This is based on private claims data. And uh, there might, with that, we might uh, open the door for some selection bias. I'll be quick. Um, Actually, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have six minutes left, and since we have a hard stop time, what I was wondering is um, maybe we are going to make your slides available to everybody after the data fair. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to pick one or two more things to highlight and then maybe um, – sure. pick a question to answer? But most importantly, can you – uh, can one of you type contact information in for all of the attendees so that if they want to get more, have more dialogue or sure. find out more? There, it's, perfect. It's right here, yeah. Okay, that's the perfect. On, the only thing I would mention at the, uh, before I get to that page is the policy implication of that. And I will leave uh, with the last page with our contact information. The policy implication obviously is important. We need to provide early screening for cognitive uh, condition, uh, potential cognitive decline among individuals with physical disability and not just put the focus on physical and other comorbid conditions. This is an important issue and uh, needs to be uh, paid attention to. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. There have been a lot of questions answered or asked in the question and answer box. I know we're not going to be able to get to all of those. Um, however, I don't know if there's, a, uh, Dr. Mahmoudi, I don't know if you are able I, to open the Q&A box and see if there's one that seems to like apply or... or I am fits. not able to see that. Are you, Neil? I'm able to see them and I can um, read them out loud and answer some of them. Sure. That would be um, great. Yeah. Um, I'll, just, I'll just go down the list. So one of the questions, um, do we identify who the question asker is or remain anonymous? That's okay. Uh, I think you can just ask the question without identifying. Okay. Can non-UM faculty get access to these data sets? Uh, not usually. You, uh, you would have to go through a data use agreement process or have a collaborator at the University of Michigan, usually an um, IHPI, the Institute for Healthcare Policy Innovation member. Um, another question that was asked was, in Medicare data, can we link outpatient and inpatient data? Uh, Yes, across a, Bennett, across a patient identifier, um, across a patient identifier, yes, you can link that. Uh, another question I was asked was, so will it be possible to track people's insurance plans if they changed their health plans? 
and what their new health plans are, how can we know people become uninsured? So I think that to track people's insurance plans if they change, you, I mean, you would technically need to have an all-payer data set to do that. We would know within these particular data sets if something about their benefit design might have changed. For instance, if, they, if within Optum they went from an HMO to a PPO and they had a discontinuity in enrollment, we would be able to see that. We'll see an end date and then a start date of their new type of plan. But if they, leave, if they leave a plan under Optum, we don't know why they left. We don't know, they could have become uninsured. They could have gone to Medicaid. We don't really know. Okay, there's another question. For most administrative outpatient data, do we need to confirm whether the patients have specific diseases by counting the numbers of IC9-10 codes have been coded or one code would be sufficient? I'm asking this because physicians need to code the diseases in order to prescribe the tests to rule out the diseases. Um, for this, I, my answer to this question is that there are claims-based definitions that circle around for getting sensitivity and specificity for coding. So it does rest on the fact that someone had coded it and that typically coding practices for physicians is correlated very well with their specialty. So if you have someone who's a mental health provider, you're probably gonna have a lot of mental health codes, even if they have other co-occurring conditions. Okay, and thank you very much, Dr. Kinder. Appreciate that. Thank you to both of you. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this session and I'm going to have to close it. But for additional questions, feel free to reach out to either of our presenters or reach out to the ICPSR data help team, data fair help team, which is in the chat box. All right, see you later and thank you again. Thank you, Jenna. Yep.